Hello again. We are going to continue on with the circulatory system. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the lymphatic system and our, immun our immunity. In your textbook, it's pages 292 to 300. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to describe the structure and function of the lymphatic system in general terms. You'll be able to identify and describe the main cellular and protein components of the human immune system. You'll be able to explain how allergies, autoimmune disorders, vaccination, and antibiotics uh, in terms of immunity. And here we start with a general overview of the lymphatic system. Uh, in many ways it looks like the circulatory system uh, and that's because one of its functions is to return fluid back to our circulatory system. We've talked a couple of times now how plasma from the capillaries of the circulatory system is pushed out into interstitial cells by our by blood pressure. A lot of that fluid comes back in through osmotic pressure but some of it doesn't. So some of it's collected by lymph vessels and those lymph vessels are able to carry that fluid and dump it back into our circulatory system. So the lymph rejoins the main circulatory system through ducts that empty near large veins near the heart. And like veins, lymphatic vessels have valves to ensure uh, one-way flow. So because there's no no real pressure inside of lymph vessels, they have the same kind of one-way valves that allow for only one direction of flow for the extracellular fluid that's being returned to our heart. A uh, couple other things. Here's the thymus. It's responsible for some uh, white blood cell production. The rest of these um, labels uh, aren't really necessary or are too detailed uh, for our level of exploration. So thoracic duct, uh, the position of the spleen, uh, red bone marrow, that kind of stuff, we're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about uh, these things. Here's an example of what the lymphatic ducts look like. As you can see, they're dead end ducts. So unlike uh, the arterioles and the venules, uh, the lymph vessels are closed at one end. It's closely related to the cardiovascular system. It takes up that extra tissue fluid and returns it to the bloodstream. It's also involved in the absorption of fatty acids in the intestinal villi. If you remember, these were the lacteals, and we talked about those in the digestive system. It also helps defend the body against disease. Now, lymph nodes are little pockets of lymph, lymph uh, found along lymph vessels. So each node contains a sinus or a space that's filled with lymphocytes and macrophages, two types of white blood cell. And examples of these groupings include the tonsils, the adenoids. Uh, there's also grouping, groups of these uh, nodes found in the armpits and in the groin areas. And this is when people get sick, especially when they have a throat infection. If they uh, put their hands just underneath their jawbone, they can feel some swelling just beneath their neck. And that's actually the swelling of these lymph nodes as they start to accumulate uh, white blood cells, lymphocytes, and macrophages in order to fight off these infections. So the spleen and thymus are glands that are part of the lymphatic system and the immune system. They help produce and mature white blood cells. So the lymphatic system, its purpose is, its second purpose is immunity. Uh, it's able to defend against infectious agents, foreign cells, and abnormal body cells, including cancer. There's two basic uh, types of defense that are, that are enacted by the lymphatic system. There's the non-specific defense, which is cell-mediated, and it includes several, type, several types of white blood cells that kill bacteria at the source of infection by engulfing them. So basically these non-specific defenses go out and they attack any cell that they don't think should be in our body. And so it doesn't matter if it's a viral if it's a virus or what type of bacterial cell it is, they're non-specific. Anything that looks foreign, they eat it. Then there's specific defenses that is conducted by the lymphocytes and this is antibody mediated and it's a more specialized defense. These cells and there there's B cells that produce antibodies and T cells that actually go out and attack cells and there's also uh, suppressor T cells that go off and, and kill some of these kill off the B cells and T cells when they're done. But the T cells and the B cells, there's a specific type of B cell 
for each infection we get. So for each type of bacteria that we get infected with, there's only one group of B cells that actually get involved in the immune response. And during a time of illness, the number of infection fighting cells is going to increase, and that's what causes the nodes to swell. So in a general uh, overview of immunity, uh, the first response to immunity is the fact that we have protective barriers. We have a layer of skin, and most of our openings, our mouth and our ears and our eyes, are, uh, they're filled with either cilia or mucus to keep things from getting too deep within our body. If things do get in, either through a cut or through inhalation, uh, or if we eat it, there's a cell-mediated response where phagocytes attack the pathogen at the entry point. Often there's inflammation associated with that caused by the production of a histamine. And then complementary proteins, which exist in our blood, they're there all the time, they go and attack the pathogen as well. The last thing that the cell-mediated response is going to do is prepare for an antibody-mediated response. So some of the cells involved in the cell-mediated response are there to get ready for or to start the antibody-mediated response. The antibody-mediated response, uh, T cells attack the pathogen directly and stimulate B cells. So we have T cells, and these are all lymphocytes. There's T cells and B cells. The T cells are going to attack the pathogen directly and stimulate B cells. The pathogen specific antibodies are released by B cells, so each pathogen has a has a specific antibody that's going to latch onto it and help the, the body fight it off. And then memory cells are going to store pathogen proteins. So basically every time a pathogen enters our body, we are after we destroy it, after our white blood cells destroy that pathogen, the white blood cells are going to save little bits of it just in case that pathogen comes back again. So for example with chickenpox, we get the chickenpox virus once, we fight it off. After killing off all of those viruses, little bits of them are saved by our memory cells. That way if we're exposed to chickenpox again, the chickenpox re-enters our body, we already are ready or we already have a memory of what antibodies we need to produce in order to fight it off faster. And that's why often people don't get a reinfection of chickenpox is because we fight it off before the symptoms actually appear. So the barrier, res barrier response is the first response. Protective barriers, our skin is pretty much impenetrable to bacteria and parasites. Also we have mucus in our respiratory passage that helps trap inhaled microbes and then they're swept away by the hair like cilia. We can cough them out or they get pushed up and over into our um, digestive system where they can be broken down by the acid. Most ingested invaders are destroyed by stomach acid so even if there's bacteria on food a lot of that bacteria can be destroyed by our stomach acid. Even our tears, so our eyes are an opening to our body. Uh, lysozyme is a special enzyme that's present in tears so that when dust or dirt hits our eye we produce tears and those tears have a special enzyme that destroys uh, bacteria. So now we'll look at the white blood cells. So once we get past those barrier responses, we're going to look at an antibody, the cell and antibody mediated responses. Granulocytes are non-specific immunity. They have a short lifespan. So granulocytes are a type of white blood cell. And they are a phagocyte for the most part. Most of these granulocytes are going to um, try to digest foreign invaders. Neutrophiles act, are active phagocytes. They are capable of only one phagocytotic event and then they're done. So they'll eat something, explode, and then they're done. And xenophiles play a role in fighting viral infections. And bacillophiles are going to be the ones releasing histamines. And we'll talk about the role of histamines in a little bit. Macrophages are another type of phagocyte that arise from monocytes. And these, again, non specific cell mediated response. But what they do is they aid specific immunity response. They help lymphocytes because they're going to start saving things called antigens. So when a macrophage consumes a foreign cell or foreign material, it saves a little bit of it, a little bit of its protein, and it's called an antigen, and it presents it to lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are then going to respond to that specific infection. So based on what the macrophage presents to them, 
the lymphocytes are going to, uh, specific lymphocytes are going to be activated to fight off the infection. The B cells are responsible for producing antibodies. T cells are a cellular response uh, to a specific uh, pathogen. Here is a breakdown of the white blood cells in terms of nomenclature. So all white blood cells are called leukocytes and they can be grouped into two major groups the phagocytes and the lymphocytes. Phagocytes are basically pathogen eaters. And those can again be broken down into two groups, granulocytes and monocytes. And the, the basophiles, they're non-phagocytotic, they produce the histamine, but they are granulocytes as well. Monocytes can become macrophages, not all of them do. Uh, and then there's the lymphocytes, which are your T cells and B cells. And then there's just a whole bunch of different types of T cells and a couple of types of B cells. Notice that both the T and B cells have memory cells. So a place to store information about past infections. Uh, the plasma cells are the ones that produce antibodies. And then each type of T cell has a specific job. And we're going to talk about that over the next few minutes. So the cell mediated response is our second line of defense, the non-specific defense. It's the neutrophiles, eosinophiles, and monocytes engulfing a foreign pathogen. So something's infected our body these three types of cells are going to go out and try and destroy them. So neutrophiles, suicide bombers, they engulf one pathogen and explode as pus. They release a bunch of digestive enzymes to break that pathogen up. Monocytes also can engulf foreign invaders. Some of them turn into macrophages and macrophages are kind of special. They save the membrane proteins from a pathogen. And if you remember way back, well for us it's only a few weeks ago, but when we talked about cell membranes, we drew this phospholipid bilayer and we said that there's these big proteins that have jobs to do. And some of them go all the way through the membrane, some of them sit inside the membrane, some of them sit outside the membrane. But these proteins are cell specific or species specific. In other words, some of the proteins that exist in our cells don't exist on bacterial cells and some of the proteins in bacterial cells don't exist in our cells. So what macrophages do is they save these, some, of these, some of these membrane proteins and they present them to helper T cells. So helper T cells come out when there's a response to an infection and they interact with the macrophages. If the macrophage presents a protein or an antigen that doesn't belong in our body that initiates the helper T cell into an antibody mediated response. The pathogen protein activates complementary proteins as well that are present in our blood plasma. Complementary proteins, uh, they're always there and they react to foreign invaders. There's a couple of things, a few things they can do. Uh, one thing is they coat the outside of the invader uh, with a protein coat that that nothing can get through and basically suffocates the invading microbe. Some of them are actually able to destroy the cell membrane of the invader, so it's kind of like being skinned alive. Others act as homing beacons, so the protein will attach itself to a foreign invader and that makes it easier for neutrophiles and macrophages to find it and destroy it. Now the antibody mediated response starts once a helper T cell has interacted with a macrophage and said yes there's something foreign in our body we need to start producing antibodies to destroy it. So it's our third line of defense it's pathogen specific and it's conducted by lymphocytes white blood cells that produce or use antibodies. The antibodies are produced in response to the presence of foreign antigens those things grabbed by the macrophages. Antigens are present on the cell wall of the bacterium or the protein coat of viruses. They're also present in some poisons uh, produced by bacteria, molds, or algae. So even things that aren't necessarily alive, we can have an antibody response to. Two types of lymphocytes are the T cells and B cells. T cells are produced by bone marrow, they're stored in the thymus. They're specific cellular response. B cells are actually the antibody producers. Each type of B cell produces a unique antibody, or each B cell only produces one type of antibody, 
that antibody can only uh, interact with one type of foreign invader. Some of these B cells that turn into plasma cells can produce up to 2,000 antibodies per second. So once a B cell has been activated, it can produce a large amount of antibodies. So the helper T cell interacts with the macrophage. It recognizes the foreign antigen as being foreign. And it releases a chemical that stimulates B cells. It also activates killer T cells. Those killer T cells are going to go out and destroy foreign invaders as well. The B cells are going to do uh, two things. One thing they're going to do is reproduce, so they're, they're going to produce more B cells. And then those, some of those B cells are going to go and become plasma cells that produce a whole bunch of antibodies. And those antibodies bind to the membrane-bound proteins of a pathogen and aid in destroying it. So pathogens that are covered with these antibodies are easily identified. So antibodies go and cover the pathogen, or they cause pathogens to clump together, which allows macrophages to find them easily and engulf them more quickly. It also allows killer T cells to find these foreign invaders. And what these killer T cells do is they punch holes in the cell membrane of that pathogen. And what happens is, if this is a foreign bacteria, and a T cell puts a hole in it. Now, most cells have lots and lots of molecules. So high molecule concentration inside, low molecule concentration outside, and water starts going in the hole and literally fills up that foreign pathogen until it explodes. So they die by osmosis. When there's holes in their membrane, they can't stop water from leaking in until they explode. So here's how the antigen-antibody reaction works. Antibodies are Y-shaped proteins that target specific invading microbes. And it turns out that on an antibody, the end of the antibody has a specific geometry. So antibodies have a specific geometry that's going to match up to the geometry of an antigen from a bacteria. And that's why they generally don't attach to our own cells, is because our own body cells are always going to have a different shape of protein in their cell membranes. So the foreign cells, they're going to have a specific geometry. It's going to match up with one of our antibody types. The antibody antibodies bind to antigens at the end of the arms through complementary shapes. Bacteria and viruses have many different markers but antibodies can only bind to one type of complementary antigen. So each antibody is only allowed to bind to one specific spot on any one type of bacteria or virus. So binding the anti antibody makes the invading cell much easier uh, to find for macrophages. The antibodies can cause invading microbes to clump together, uh, making them into a large mass for, uh, of target cells. Antibodies can bind to toxins as well, so sometimes uh, poisons. This is how we can build up poison resistance, actually. Uh, by taking small amounts of a poison, you build up this antibody resistance to it. Um, same idea, it attaches to the poisons and prevents them from entering receptor sites on our cells. Then these toxins are engulfed by macrophages or monocytes and disposed of. The antigen markers generally aren't destroyed. They are kept by macrophages in their cell membrane. After all the pathogen has been dest destroyed, suppressor T cells, and suppressors because what they do is they, they suppress their immune system from being overly active. They destroy the plasma B cells and the killer T cells that were dealing with the infection. Otherwise, what can happen is that these plasma cells and killer T cells become rogue cells. They get kind of bored and they start going and perforating body cells instead of foreign cells, which isn't a good thing. Cells that are left behind memory cells. There's T memory cells and B memory cells that are created during the infection. The memory T cells actually save the antigen. If the antibody, if that antigen enters our body again, they can go and activate B cells immediately to produce antibodies. The memory B cells save the necessary antibodies uh, required to mark the foreign pathogen if it should ever return. 
Memory cells can cut the length of infection time by more than half, and symptoms of that infection may not even show up. And the example I used before was chickenpox. The first time we get chickenpox, we can uh, have those red bumps for a week or more. The actual infection would have entered our body before that, even up to a week before that, we would have had the chickenpox virus and just not known it. During that time, the chickenpox virus establishes itself, and those red scabs start to show up on our skin. We fight the virus off, and then if we're ever, we fight the virus off, we get memory cells, and now if that infection ever returns, the memory cells start fighting it off immediately. So even though we're exposed to chickenpox, and even though it's in our body, it may be even in there for a week, but by the end of that week, it's been killed off, and we don't even see any signs of the infection uh, in our body, except for raised antibody, raised antibody levels or raised, raised white blood cell levels. Here's a summary of the um, immune response. Same pictures in your textbook. Pathogens have to reach the first, first line of defense through the skin, and this is a splinter or something, so there's a hole in the skin, and a pathogen is entering that hole. So if it makes it past that, nonspecific non phagocytotic leukocytes um, arrive at the site. Now some of them are going to release histamine, others are going to try to destroy the cell. The phagocytotic macrophages engulf and destroy the invading bacteria, and the accumulation of dead macrophages and bacteria is visible as pus. And this is really even how a pimple develops. We have hair follicles. Hair follicles provide a path, passage into our skin that dust and dirt and bacteria can get into. So bacteria gets to the end of the hair follicle and it starts to reproduce. Our body finds out there's a foreign invader there and it sends out phagocytotic macrophages to go and destroy it. As it destroys that foreign invader, it produces pus. And that pus causes the skin to swell and redden. And that's... Uh, that's what a pimple is. The third line of defense begins after the pathogen has been destroyed. The antigens from the pathogen protrude from the cell membrane of macrophages. So as macrophages eat these foreign invaders, and here we have a macrophage. So C is a macrophage. And notice that these little, here's what it's trying to show. If we look at B, here's a macrophage, and you can see these little structures here. These are the antigens. They're saved on the surface of the macrophage. And the macrophage is going to interact with a T cell. When they interact, the T cell finds out that, hey, well, this little thingy here, oh, sorry, this little antigen here belongs to a foreign invader. So it's going to activate B cells. So the antibodies on the B cells bind to the antigen, contributing to the destruction of the pathogen. T cells bind to B cells. And they say, hey, look, see this thing? It's not good. We have to destroy it. So the B cells are activated to form plasma B cells and memory cells. The plasma B cells produce tons and tons of antibodies. The memory B cells uh, store the antibodies in case it should return uh, a second time. Now, allergies and autoimmune diseases are actually related to this antibody antigen response. Allergies occur when your body identifies a harmless protein belonging to a chem belonging be let me try that one more time. When your body identifies harmless cells or proteins as being harmful. So for example, peanut butter is a protein, so it has antigen markers. Um, people with peanut allergies, their immune system has marked that protein as being foreign and therefore it needs to be destroyed. Even though peanut butter itself is not a dangerous substance, the body is treating it as such and is actually starting to fight against it in a way that's inappropriate or an overreaction. Autoimmune disease is when the immune system actually starts attacking self cells. So lymphocytes start attacking body cells, whether it be our own connective tissue or muscle tissue. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is when T and B cells start attacking bone and connective tissue. Uh, what happens is drugs and aging can weaken or reduce the number of suppressor T cells in our body, allowing those rogue T's and B's to run around and cause havoc. Vaccines are a way of boosting our immune system. And what they do is they introduce a weakened amount of dead, deadly virus with its antigens. So 
the idea is if you just give our white blood cells the antigens, then they'll fight off that weakened virus, which is easy to do, and produce antibodies in case a more harmful virus uh, comes in contact with us. And this is the idea behind the flu shot. Uh, smallpox was the first vaccine. It was introduced in 1796. And the way it worked was that we vaccinated people by giving them cowpox instead. Cowpox was similar, but less virulent. It had the same antigen markers. So by being exposed to small cowpox, we were able to build up a resistance to smallpox. Rabies was the next one. Uh, laboratory techniques were used to weaken an existing virus. And then those weakened viruses were injected into people in order to fight off uh, non-weakened rabies viruses later. Polio, actually, polio vaccination, and we still do polio vaccinations, uh, introducing a dead virus into our body allows us to produce the antibodies in case the living one should ever show up. Antibiotics are a little bit different. Antibiotics attack invading organisms directly, so instead of boosting our immune system, it's almost a way of replacing it. Uh, generally what they do is they block chemical reactions and metabolic pathways essential to bacterial life, but generally harmless to us. So what they do is they interfere with processes necessary for bacterial life. They'll say disrupt the cell wall formation process or cell division process, thereby making that bacteria obsolete. Syphilis was one of the first diseases to be treated using chemical agents. Mercury was used to uh, kill off syphilis. It acted as a chemical or a competitive inhibitor, so it blocked enzyme catalyzed reactions. Allergic reaction to antibiotics, same idea as allergic reactions to other substances. The chemical or the antibiotic is recognized as foreign and that initiates an immune response. In terms of resistance, sometimes bacteria build up resistance to antibiotics. Uh, and what happens is if there's a, even a few bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotic, if they're not killed off by our own immune system, then those bacteria get a chance to reproduce and, and spread their population. And now instead of just having one or two bacteria that are uh, resistant to the antibiotic, the entire bacterial colony is now resistant to that particular antibiotic. Uh, the other sneaky thing bacteria can do, and you'll talk a little bit more about it in Bio30, is they can share genetic inf information between species. So one species of bacteria can actually conjugate or get together with another species of bacteria, and they can trade genetic information. So it's kind of like, imagine cats and dogs being able to uh, join and then share DNA. It's the same sort of idea, so it's kind of weird. But uh, bacteria have this ability, and it's a way that they can spread uh, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. So from this lecture, uh, you should have the idea that the lymphatic system is a collection of dead-end vessels with one-way valves and lymph nodes. As fluid is returned to a circulatory system, uh, it passes through the lymph nodes where we have white blood cells, and there it's, a, it's almost like a cleaning mechanism. As that fluid is just before it gets dumped into our circulatory system, it's checked out for foreign material, and if there is any, then the white blood cells in our lymph nodes are able to destroy the uh, foreign pathogen. Pathogens are first engaged by a cell-mediated response, which consists mostly of macrophage or uh, phagos mostly of phagocytosis, cells trying to eat them and destroy them. The cell-mediated response often is followed by the antibody-mediated response involving lymphocytes, T cells and B cells. The B cells are involved in the production and storage of antibodies. T cells engage pathogens directly using the antigen-antibody reaction. Allergies are a result of an overactive immune system or overactive immune response to, a, to the presence of a particular antigen. What's basically happening is our body says, hey, this thing shouldn't be in our body, and our body starts to close all of its openings, such as the airway, which isn't a good thing because then we can't get air in uh, either. So, Vaccines provide uh, pathogen antibodies to our immune system, whereas antibiotics attack the bacteria directly, uh, trying to destroy its metabolism.